This is Alistair Coburn. You're listening to Agile Uprising Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Agile Uprising Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Lifehood, and today I have with me again, William Stryden. Say hello, William. Hi, hey, Troy. So William was on our previous podcast about uh, the cancer four-player model, right, and getting teams unstuck. So he's back. Um, people really seem to like that podcast, so we brought him back on. And today, William, what are we going to be talking about? We're going to talk about spiral dynamics, transformative cultural change and how spiral dynamics can help you in that process. So you're talking about transformative cultural change. So I'm thinking us agile coaches, right? We are trying to do that as well at at organizations. So is this strictly for agile? Is this an agile thing or where did this come from? Why would we use it? No, this is something that was created by Claire Graves when he was doing research at the Union College in New York. Okay. Um, and this was done back in the 50s and 60s. Um, and Don Beck, uh, who's from Texas, kind of found out about this work and helped him to kind of make it broader in the world and actually bring it out on the world stage. Um, one of the strengths about this model that was created was it helps with large scale change. Um, they actually used it for the transformation in South Africa when the ANC came into power and they did a peaceful transition from the apartheid era into the, the modern era where Nelson Mandela came to be president. Right. So Don Beck himself, who worked with Claire Graves, was a consultant, correct, for Nelson Mandela? Is that correct? Right? Yes, yeah. he was. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. So why don't we get into, we know why we would use it, right, for cultural change. So how does that apply to what we do as Agile coaches? Well, a lot of times we talk about we need to meet people where they're at. So we probably need to figure out where are they at so we can meet them there. Right, okay, yeah. And spiral dynamics, uh, they say in the purest form, it's an evolutionary human development model. Okay. Or... For me, the piece I take out of it is it's a a value system that highlights various um, cultural levels in it um, or where people are at, if I can put it that way. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. What's really cool about this is it uses colors for shorthand to make it easier to talk about this. Okay. Uh, And uh, it's probably time we introduce the people to the different colors. Okay. And actually, William, before we get to the colors, maybe we can talk about evolution and what evolutionary change even means. Right. So uh-huh. we have biological evolution, okay, and everybody knows what that is. So we're going to be talking about psychological evolution, right? Uh, evolution of the mind, of cultures, um, and this is, that's what spiral dynamics is really all about. So just wanted to preface that. Um, okay, William, so let's take it away. So the colors start at uh, what they call a beige level. And this color represents, um, it's almost like people are in survival mode and it's very instinctive. Um, think, you know, caveman folks, you just literally trying to survive in the world, uh, all individualistic. Mm-hmm. And you just, where's you gonna, where you're going to get your, ne- your next meal? And make sure you don't get killed or you die by a wild animal catching you. Right. So so when humans first evolved, this was the first, we're going to call it a value system, right? That's so the right. first value system was basically just survivalistic, needing to make more people to survive, things like that, right? And that was about, I would say, 150,000 years ago, approximately, you know, according to evolution. So yeah. um, that's what we're talking about. So they call that beige, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Cool. So every uh, value level has got a good and a bad manifestation of it. Okay. Um, So one level is not better than another level. They just, they exist. They are there. They're part of our society and the world we live in. Right. It's not like a maturity model. 
That's great. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's that's why I keep referring it for myself as it's a value system, okay. and there's as anything there's a, a good side to it and there's a bad side to it. Okay. For example, on a beige side, we might say a healthy manifestation of it is that you are surviving and you're taking care of yourself. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Makes sense. A bad manifestation of it is eating and sleeping disorders, being homeless without a roof over your head, um, <laughs> drug addicts, you know. Um, right. So we're talking about very primal, you know, instinctive, survivalistic. So healthy is being the ability to survive independently and take care of yourself, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So obviously the unhealthy version side of it is not having not having the ability to take care of yourself. Okay. Yeah. Or you're enough. struggling with something. You're falling on hard times. Something is happening. It's not right. always under your control. It's just something that happens. Okay. So let's talk about the next uh, the next value system, uh, okay. which was the next st stage of uh, human evolution, uh, and that's the purple value system. So let's talk, let's talk about that one. Yeah. So. Purple is described as where there's kin spirit. Um, it's like tribes are starting to form. So instead of just surviving on your own, groups, tribal um, things started to evolve at that point. Right. So mysticism, right? Yes. Su uh, superstition. These types of things came out of that. So while, as you're talking, William, I'm thinking about if humans for a long time were just surviving by themselves... They probably maybe realized that if they joined up in small kind of communities or something, that they had a better chance of survival. And I'm thinking maybe that was their initial cause. I don't know, but I'm thinking that might have just been a kind of a reaction or a natural evolution from the beige. Right? That's yeah. correct. Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, growing up in South Africa, it's one of the things where we still see it alive and well there. Um, the Bushman tribes living in the Kalahari Desert they still live at that purple level. It mm. doesn't make them backward or anything. It's just that's the way they live. And they, I spent some time with them in the military and they're actually great people. I learned quite a lot from them. Okay. And they are at the purple level and some of them have evolved and are at different value systems higher up in the colors that we'll talk about. Okay. So what do you think would be an, a healthy manifestation of purple? So having peace, uh, you know, being grounded, um, they've got safety when they're together in their numbers. Um, they also, there's some emotions and it creates trust for them. Okay. So it's kind of like, like you said, that the idea of people getting together, um, tribes, right? I'm thinking about causality. So maybe something like, um, like I said, superstition. Um, so a mysticism, so witch doctors, stuff like this probably came out of that. If you think about, there probably was none of that stuff in, in beige, right? Most likely. Yeah, it was just right. individuals. It was people on their right. own. Yeah. Right. So a lot of these things. So, so that's healthy. How about an unhealthy manifestation? Well, it could be if, if you in that other tribe and not my tribe, it might be where they is close, evasive, um, I'm fearful of that tribe is bigger than my tribe. You mm -hmm. know, there might be some, um, I've got, we've got food they don't have. They might attack us to get it. Right. Uh, things like that. Okay. Right. Makes sense. Okay. So that's about, um, the origins of that are about 40,000 years ago. So, um, what's, what was kind of the next step of, um, of evolution? The next one is, uh, the red value system. Uh, that's about 10,000 years ago. And there we're talking uh, power gods and where it's once again the power is coming back to the individual. Um, out of the tribes, it's like I'm leading this tribe and I am the guy who's calling the shots. Um, mm. In our later dates, which are probably still alive and well, is it might be like the mafia. I'm in charge and I'm controlling what we're doing. Right. So total, total command and control. Right. So the idea of command and control really came from this type of value system. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And we do talk about egocentric. Okay. You're looking at the world from yourself, self gratification and immediate gratification. If you've got that impulse now, you're going to act it out. Right. You live for the moment. 
Yikes. Not considering long-term thinking, right? Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. All right. So how about some healthy and unhealthy manifestations of red? Yeah. So healthy manifestations here will be you assertive. Um, you do it in the moment. You show courage. Um, you act immediately on what needs to be done here and now. So mm. you kind of move things forward. Um, of course, when you do a really, really good job at that, you do it in a respectful way. Mm. That's what we call. So it's needed, it's there, and it's done in a, a very uh, healthy way. Right. Makes sense. How about some unhealthy manifestations? Well, you might be oversimplifying things. Impatience comes out here. Mm. Um, very harsh. Um, you almost where people go, you too honest. Um, you know, right. there is that thing speaking uh, truth to power. It kind of lives here where sometimes these people, they say they don't have a filter. It just comes out and right. it may make things worse in that moment. Right. So uh, another unhealthy manifestation of red would be dictatorships. Right. Yes. And we still see that, you know, pretty present in our in politics today. As far as, you know, some countries have dictatorships. Yep. So that is a country that's living under a red value system. That's basically. correct. Yeah. And we also see that in, in even in companies, you know, you will see um, certain people with this value system, uh, some certain types of leaders that have this value system. Right. Um, and like like we said, it can be a healthy or unhealthy manifestation of it. Yeah. Um, but it is it is needed at times. So when do you think, you know, an example in a company where a red the red value system might be very valuable to have there? Well, if something happens and you all of a sudden find yourself in a crisis, mm. command control is good in that situation for that moment, not for moving forward from them onwards. But right. how do we get out of this firefighting mode back into a place where we can come up for air and then go back situationally to let's be more move into an affiliative or another leadership style visionary coaching leadership style that's needed but in the moment it may be calling for command control which comes out of that red value system so imagine people are living for quite a uh, time in this red value system and being kind of dominated by dictators right uh, something else emerged from that and and that's what we would call the blue value system correct that's correct okay so let's talk about the blue value system um, where did this come from and I mean it makes sense to me um, and I'll just talk a little bit about what I know about the blue value system, yeah. that it's hierarchy based, right? Um, a lot of structure, order. So our modern type of governments, right? Uh, yeah. Laws, rules, policies, all these things. This comes from this blue value system. So if you think about red, meaning someone is just telling everyone what to do, that doesn't really exist there, right? You're just listening to one person. Um, and then other things come from this. So a lot of our major religions come from this value system. So, um, sacrificing yourself for a greater good, right? Yep. Uh, greater purpose. Um, uh, how about something like um, pride in your nation, right? Um, willing to die for your country for these greater causes. Like a lot of these things come from this blue value system, right? It's kind of the next step of evolutionary thinking. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. And it's also the... In this value system, people are living by the rules so they can be rewarded later. Right. Um, a lot of the um, religions are set up that way. If you live by this, you're going to have the afterlife, things like that. It's not immediate re reward or gratification that comes out of it. Right. Um, it's also where authority uh, lives here and hierarchy kind of was built in, in this uh, value system as well. Um, the Romans wouldn't have built that great army of theirs and be so successful in, in their campaigns if they didn't have this value system, which I think is in the blue system. Right. And we probably would get into a lot, a lot more car crashes without it too, right? So <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because you need rules and policy and everything else, right? Laws. Yeah. So how about some healthy manifestations of the blue value system? So things that come up here are things like concrete, meticulous, um, reliable, um, steer a straight course, uh, fair and without surprises. Right. So this is pretty much when we talk about predict and plan. 
right. kind of comes out of this value system and as like well. HR, right? Yes. Setting up the titles, you move up in the structure. If you do this, that eventually you'll get rewarded for it. This type of way of thinking, right? So this is kind of in 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 companies where we're talking about that, right? But you can see how it applies to not just companies but culture in general, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So how about some unhealthy manifestations? This is where you go, think these rules that were laid down, we're going to follow them. We're going to be very strict about them. Right. We're not allowed to break the rules yet. Um, it can sometimes be polarizing. Yeah. It divides people into opposites. Um, it becomes fixed and inflexible. Yeah. Um, we And sometimes it kind of, especially in some organizations, it leads to we've got silos. Yeah. Because it was set up that way. It functioned really great at one point, mm-hmm. and now it's getting to the point where it became inflexible, and now people are holding on to it. It's almost it became like institutionalized or tradition, right? Um, and it's not that fluidity is is missing there. We almost talk about extreme bureaucracy. Mm. So politically, uh, we can even talk about. I know not everyone's from the U.S. that listens to this podcast, right? But traditionally, what one would think of um conservative type of uh, principles right kind of live in this value system um i would say traditional conservatism lives in this value system and we'll talk about what the next one is and and the differences between um traditional conservatism and then more of a business type of innovation type of conservatism too which would be the next one which is the orange value system which emerged probably you know a couple thousand years ago but really we're talking about in the last four or five hundred years where it really um, took hold, right? Particularly in the Enlightenment period. Right? Yes. So why don't we talk a little bit about this one? Yeah, so Orange is very strive-driven. Uh, they're looking for results. We're looking for almost instant gratification at times. Um, mm. There's a, a big driving force where it's probably those folks wanted to break away from the status quo. Right. Um, and they were probably regarded as rebels in their day. Um, and this is also where people started thinking more strategically. Mm-hmm. Um, how can we change things moving forward? Okay. So if you think about it historically, right, um, the idea of giving up your life for a greater good, whether that's religion, whether that's um, not some sort of... Um, patriotism, right? These types of blue value systems things, right? Along came people who were doing a lot of scientific experiments, you know, utilizing empiricism, and they were valuing empiricism over the other value systems, right? Over that, over the religion, over the politics, they said, what's important is what we can measure, right? And what we can prove. And so out of this, we got innovation, you know, all of our modern day um, businesses, right? Industry, yeah. came from this uh, value the, the free market free market capitalism came from this and that's why I said to me conservatism is a bit blue and it's a bit orange it's kind of both right yeah. if you think about that um, and not that you can't be a capitalist and not be conservative you can but if you think of traditionally right that's what we're talking about um, so how about um, some healthy manifestations of orange yeah so healthy things that come from the orange value system is results come from this people being results driven Uh, they've got goals they want to achieve they exploratory they want to what can be done how can we get there Um, that like I said that ability to think think strategically Mm. Um, you're getting into problem solving yeah and entrepreneurship also lives in, in this value system right so things like in the abs world I'm thinking about things like lean startup right innovation accounting things that are very metrics driven we don't know we don't care about the hierarchy we don't care about the we don't what we really care about is getting the results right what do we have to measure to find out the results to drive the innovation to make sure we're successful and so that's to me this is the orange value system like yeah moving up. what's that goal we're going to hit right kpis yeah. these types of things right? yes so how about some unhealthy manifestations because there's quite a few I can imagine. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and there's that thing where they sometimes calculating. um, And for me, that kind of comes into the 
in this value system, there's the win at all costs. So the win lose paradigm is here. Right. As long as I win, I don't care who loses. Right. Um, and there, to me, an opp uh, opportunistic. Um, there's also exploitation of the living environment um, or, or resources, if you want to look at that. Some mm. people say, well, they're plundering the earth. Um, all these things are, are negative things. Um, they can also be manipulative and abusing nature and environments. Um, think Enron here. Yeah. These yeah. they were so driven with showing good results, they didn't care who was going to lose at the end of the day or who what they manipulated to get to that point. Right. Um, and this is what some people would consider an unhealthy manifestation of business when you put only profits ahead of everything else, right? Yes. Ab above your employees, above the environment, above everything. That's all that matters is the bottom line. And let's burn everything else. Who cares, right? Yeah. And that's something that's an unhealthy. Another one um, is uh, materialism. We see the lot. We see that a lot in our in culture in the U.S. Um, it's very can be very materialistic, and this idea of you know flashy cars and money and all these things. This comes from this orange type of uh, value system, right? Yeah, as we would say, keeping up with the Joneses. Yep. Pretty much. Yeah. And it's also where people lose a little bit of touch of the human aspect. Um, right. They're so into the results or the goals or moving the KPIs. It's like we don't really care whose expense it's coming at. And it's funny because the blue value system, which is that structure and hierarchy, is, is a little more on the human side than this one. You know, so we may think it's uh, it's not. I mean, yeah, there's probably an essence of command and control in the blue. Right, not like the red, of course. It's probably a reaction to the red, yeah. but it's not like the orange, where the unhealthy manifestation of orange is, you know, just we don't care about people at all, right? Yeah. And I can see, I can tell you that from working in organizations where I see a lot of blue, that doesn't mean that they don't care about their people. In fact, it's typically when you see more orange that you tend to see less of the caring about the people. To be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's just an observation. Yeah. 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 And just to say, all these value systems they exist, and there's good and bad in it. We might be talking more about the bad side of orange here, but like I'm saying, this is also in the world where results live. If there's an absence of orange, you're not going to get to results. Yeah. If we didn't have orange, we wouldn't even have the current world we live in right now. Yeah, <laughs> all the businesses we have in technology came from orange. You know that type yeah. of thing. So. It's also, uh, from me, I think it's kind of way, especially in in America, it's where most businesses are. Not all businesses, but mm -hmm. most businesses are at this orange level. Right. So, some at blue, some at orange, and you'll see when we get to, when we talk about the next one. Why don't we just transition to that one? Yeah, then, let's right? do that. So. The next kind of evolutionary um, stage uh, we call green value system. And really, it's only been prevalent in the last century, if you think about it. Right? Yes. Right. So why don't we talk about this one? Yeah, so green is where we talk about the human bond. Um, this is where consensus lives in, in this value system. Um, this is also where um, we talk about, you know, uh, flower power, all these things where it's really the human aspect is amped up in this value system. So things like individuals and interactions, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Being a value, right? right? Come yeah. from a green value system. Yeah. yeah. That's why I said in the other podcast when we were talking about the Cantor model that yeah. for me, I think Agile kind of grew out of this green value system. It might still be evolving and moving, right. but I think this is where it started at this level. Yeah, I mean, and we're going to talk in a little bit about where the Agile values kind of live here um, and Agile transformations. But going back to green for a second, before we get into the Agile side of things, I know I brought that up, but um, we can even talk about politically um, what we would consider liberalism, which is a more modern day um, thing. You know, it really only in the last century that it has come about. That comes from this green value system. So things like diversity. Right. Yep. Things like we care about diversity. We care about inclusion. We care about that more than just profit. Right. Yep. And c collaboration and consensus building and all these things. This is coming from the green value system. So a lot of great things 
uh, you know, coming from. So make peace, not war. This type of <laughs> this type of thinking, right? Yeah, and it's also the a lot of people here think about what are we protecting? Um, are we looking out? That's why they talk about the green movement and solar energy and all these things come out. It's right. very it's tied to this uh, value system for me. So a lot of great things, obviously, from green, like we just talked about. So what are some unhealthy manifestations of green? Did we even talk about healthy manifestations of green yet? Oh, I thought we did, but let's go into it. <laughs> Maybe there's some more, yeah. I mean, All right. <laughs> there's also, like I was saying, there's a lot of consensus. And this is one where uh, it's like people at the center point, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of personal development and collective development. Uh, a lot of people talk about... Uh, community building mm. all that lives in in this space for me um and like you were saying all inclusiveness accepting differences um and this is one where people they don't just care about the people but also the planet mm. they're starting to think more global it's not just we're looking at our community yeah what's the bigger picture here right okay yeah. that makes sense yeah yeah um some unhealthy manifestations will be conflict doesn't get um, addressed right because we want to live in harmony we don't want to go and have that very uh difficult conversation about something that's coming up right um so so it's it's so uh, healthy is like we need diversity right we need multiple perspectives we need people from different backgrounds that's great but sometimes um and an unhealthy manifestation of green um diversity of thought is not valued so there has to be a collective think. Otherwise, people are ostracized or not included, right? It's almost like if you think about the blue, where there's one truth, it's almost like a new version of that is, it can be unhealthy in the green, right? So while it can be, my perspective, I could be wrong on this, but my perspective is while it can be healthy in the blue, like it can have a lot of benefits, it's almost reversed in the green, where if you, if you have that way of thinking, there's the only one truth, then you actually shut down the conversation and you shut down conflict, which is not healthy, actually. So that, to me, that I perceive that as a negative, an unhealthy manifestation of green. What do you think? Yes, and it sometimes lead to you want to make a decision, but everybody's input is valued in green. So it takes a long time to get there. So it feels like you never get to actually move forward. Or like the folks in orange level goes, these people never make a decision. You right. ask them for something and they never get there because they're right. always talking about it and want everybody's input around and it takes a while to even get... Because it's almost like democracy lives here. It's kind of like everybody needs to give their input. Right. And we don't just want to go majority rules. It's like everybody got to reach agreement before we can move on. Right. So this is where folks in this green value system, like strong facilitation is probably really needed in this value system, right? Yes. Yeah. You need someone mm -hmm. facilitating decision making and, and otherwise people will just get stuck in this communication, but not maybe ever make a decision, um, which, which is an unhealthy manifestation, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Very good. So before we move on from that, these are the six value systems that um, Claire Graves discovered in his work when he yeah. found around the globe, okay? Um, and let's just reiterate that none of these are better than the other. Mm -hmm. They are just different ways of thinking, different ways of seeing the world. And the point of this is to understand where people are coming from because you can't really leapfrog and it's nothing. it's not even really an attainable thing. It just is what it is. Right. It's not like a maturity model. If you're green, you're not any better than an orange or vice versa. Right. It has nothing to do with that. Um, it's just a way that you tend to think differently when you go into each value system. Right. Yeah. Yeah. As we all go through our own personal growth is when you may go through some transitions um, and it happens not just horizontally, but also vertically. So, yeah, you've got to become masterful at one level and at some point you'll do a, a transformation and you'll you'll move to the next value system so an interesting thing that claire grace found and you can correct me if i'm wrong william is that a small amount of people he found had the ability to see the world through any of the value systems right like they can kind of almost be a chameleon through all of them 
So they don't see the world as one way, one right way of doing things, right? So, um, and we could talk about that, and I believe that's called yellow, correct? Yeah, we right. talk the colors up to now that we've talked about, or these value systems are called the tier one ones. People who move from blue to orange or orange to green, when they encounter people at another color, like a uh, orange person will look down on a blue person or a green person will look down on an orange person yep. from that perspective. But once you get to the higher level, like yellow, you start seeing what is good and what is bad in each of these colors. That's kind of why we were talking about healthy and unhealthy. Mm. They just are, they dare, and you want to amplify the good of each and dampen the bad of each. Right. So I can tell you personally um, a story where, as William was talking about, looking down on others, not seeing things from their perspective, right? Um, I had my relationship with my parents. Um, this is a personal story, but I'll tell it. Um, because we see the world very differently, right? And like I said, I had been green and orange and these types of ways of thinking, and they are mainly blue. Um, and because of that, I just looked at, not down on them as people, but just the ideology I kind of looked down upon, right, when, and, uh, when I was younger. Um, but, and I noticed a rift in our relationship. And uh, I noticed that rift kind of uh, getting bigger, and, and there was nothing really that I didn't really see anything wrong with it. I just thought that that's the way it is, right? Because that's the way I see the world and that's the way they see the world and, me, and they're wrong. That's kind of the way I thought about it, right? Um, and it was actually um, uh, Michael Hammond. We can give him a shout out. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? I was having a conversation with Michael Hammond and, and, um, and we were talking about spiral dynamics and he said something that was pretty revolutionary to me and, and actually transformative. And I actually, I actually believe that it helped me um, kind of get through seeing the world through one way of seeing it, right? Um, and he said, and I asked him, because I'm a coach and I'm thinking about how to help people, right? So I'm thinking we have to like get somebody from blue to orange and it's this kind of maturity model. And that's the way my brain was thinking, you know? And he said, no, uh, you can't get somebody from one thing to another. Um, you just have to help them become the best at what they are, right? And I thought about that, and I said, hmm, what does he mean by that, right? Because I'm still thinking like this maturity model, right? You know, improvement. Yeah. And the more I thought about it, the more he said, you know, he was basically saying that people that see the world through this blue value system, you know, they're just, and just because you see the world through a green value system or whatever, right? It's not like I'm better or they're better than me. Yeah. It's we both have healthy manifestations of the way we see the world, right? So how, when I'm working with someone, how can I help bring out their healthy manifestations, right? If at one point they, you know, through their own way of thinking, right? If they end up thinking a different way or they go to a more results-oriented way of working or whatever, that's great, but that's, that's on them. I mean, that's the change that happens personally. But so a personal story is um, actually using this model, I was able to kind of reconnect with my parents in a way. Because what I did was I took Michael's advice and I said, well, um, even though I don't see the world through that value system, what's the good in that? Or what's the truth that they're seeing in that value system, right? And how can I help work with them on that and, and help people? So I started kind of partnering with my parents and we've been doing some good work, um, some kind of uh, work helping other people. And it's funny because we both have the same goal of helping people. We just see, we just see how to get there differently. Different right? yeah. And by using this, it, it was kind of a transformational thing for me because I said, oh, like, I, I'm, I, I saw where I was wrong, you know? That, that makes any sense, okay? Yeah. I saw that how I was seeing the world as one way of looking at things was totally wrong and that that's actually not going to cause a good relationship with my parents, to give you an example. And it's actually not going to help others. So that was pretty eye-opening to me when it comes to agile coaching because I said, everybody I'm coaching 
sees the world through these different ways, these different lenses, the individuals, right? Yeah. The teams themselves as a collective have their own value system, right? Yeah, that's great. So if I'm coming in there from this, you know, individuals and interactions and team dynamics and, you know, and these folks are just like, you know, they're just at this value system where they respect authoritarian power and hierarchy and they just want to be told what to do. And I'm coming in there talking about we got to sing Kumbaya. It's not going to resonate with them, okay? Yeah. And it's not going to make me an effective coach, right? So it's really about meeting people where they're at and identifying how they see the world and, and how they live their life and then helping them to become the best at what they are. And to me, that's kind of what a coach is anyway, if you think yeah. about it. Yeah. So go ahead, William. I know yeah, I've been talking and, and a lot. No, and, <laughs> and it is because, I mean, by doing that, if by – some circumstance, some of the people or a team moves from the blue to the orange level, great. I mean, those things will probably happen over time. Right. But that shouldn't be the aim to get them there or you feel you're a failure if you don't get there. It's more how can we make them the best at what they can do at where, where they at. Right. And there are things if you notice that a team is performing well, right, if they are doing well, things you can introduce to maybe kind of give them some ideas about, so for instance, let's take an example, right? So if a team, it works really, really well together at like doing assigned tasks, even if they assign themselves a task, let's say, yeah. right? And they're very process oriented, okay? They need that structure and, and, but let's say they're getting, you know, they're doing a good job, right? They're, they're expressing healthy manifestations of blue, let's say, right? Then introducing some things like some metrics, some KPIs, right? Uh, so a common thing we'll do at the team level is cycle time and lead time and throughput and, and some other metrics like that, right? Introducing those type of metrics to a healthy manifestation of a blue team might help them think about things that are more of that innovation, more of that metrics-driven empirical way of looking at the world and the value system, right? But you can't just say, we're going to install these things and they're going to be orange. It doesn't work that way. It's just like, it's some things you can do is you can take healthy things from orange, introduce it to a healthy blue and, and see what happens. Really, yeah. <laughs> But the, the main focus is to, is to help them make, make them become the best at what they are. Right? Yeah. And also do, like you were saying, the examples are great. Use small nudges. Just put them there as, as options or experiments for them to try. Um, Sometimes they're going to succeed and they're going to love it and that's going to become their new norm. Mm -hmm. And it might just move them where from these colors. If they go from blue to orange, you talk about they will still be in blue, but they will start exhibiting a little bit of orange colors every so often. Mm -hmm. Not in everything they do, but in a couple of things. And then you keep nudging them or you keep seeing how that movement happens until that becomes their norm as a collective. Right, so let's get back real quick to the yellow value system, which is that more of that second tier, which is you're out of one way of looking at the world and you can kind of utilize any of the value systems at any time, right? Yes. Um, and you have this ability to um, it kind of, I'm thinking about primal leadership in a way too, how you have different styles of leadership and you can utilize them for different things. It's a similar concept, right? Yeah. But if you, if you are... Like I, like I believe I was for a long time um, in the green value system, right? I would never think that acting in a red way, it would be a good idea. Like, you know, that, that's the example, yeah. right? Yeah. But I, uh, someone in, that sees the world through this yellow value system will realize that red is important and that red is valuable, blue is valuable, orange is valuable. All these things are extremely valuable and and unlocking the best out of all these things for the right circumstance um, is what's what's important, right? So obviously, um, there's going to be healthy and unhealthy of this too. So let's talk about some healthy kind of yellow value system. Yeah, yeah, we talk about when somebody works at this value system, they are critical and curious without being judgmental. Um, and they very asking questions and creativity and innovation is amped up at this value system. We talk about this as being flex flow, where depending on what's happening in the context that you're in, be it the company, the environment, the team, wherever you're at, 
you can adapt and amplify different things. Um, we talk about this as the first level at tier two because it can utilize all the tier one values. Mm. Um, like you were saying, sometimes it will go, if this team is not producing results, there isn't, they're not producing working software at the end of every sprint. What, are, what can we do to light more orange up in the team? Because that's what's missing if you don't mm. get Because the results aren't there. And that's an right. a, a orange level thing. Uh, it might be some discipline might be missing. That's mm. a blue level thing. Right. What, what can we do to do that? So you learn what can I go and turn on or what can I light up in the team that's missing? Yeah, It might be a team is so much results orientated they lighting up so much orange but they there's not a healthy blue there or there's not a healthy red when they want to make decisions right um so that's kind of why we talk there's good and bad manifestations and if you can get them all to move over to what's the healthy manifestations of the value system they add right that's when things are gonna start moving in a healthy direction for everyone and there's also this concept in sprawl dynamics of warm and cool colors and they correlate, right? So an example is red is a warm color, right? And if you look at how this um, psychological evolution happened, it always goes warm, cool, warm, cool. It seems like this this natural reaction to the other, right? Mm. So so the, the, the red power is, is um, the, the reaction to that was the blue, right? And that's the cool color. So that's that, again, structure hierarchy, greater good, all that, right? And then out of that came the warm again, which is the orange, which is not so much red authoritarian power, but more results this type of way. Right. So it's like and then and then a cool color came after that, which is the green. Right. Yeah. So it's like you, it seems like the warm is more thinking about getting things done results. Right. Like this is this is what matters. And the cool is more thinking about people. Right, the human side. Uh, right, the human side of things. Yeah. It's on, on these types of colors, right? Now we're going to touch on turquoise briefly, which is the last value system, right? That Claire Claire Graves was uh, talking about in his research, right? Yeah, one of the reason why they say this model is still evolving is there will probably be more colors coming in the not too distant future. So currently, it stops at turquoise, mm. but who knows what comes after this? Um, right. You know, it's not defined yet, but whoever will continue the work of Don Beck will probably get to a point of keep building on this. Right. So turquoise, before you even get into this one, um, if you think about the book Reinventing Organizations, uh, what they did was they took some of this work and kind of combined it. And what some of the things they combined was turquoise and yellow, and they call it teal. So if you ever hear something about a teal organization, they're really talking about the second tier of spiral dynamics, which is turquoise and yellow. I'm not a huge fan of changing things. I like to just talk about the original research. So that's what we're doing today. Um, because there are differences between yellow and turquoise. Um, yellow is a warm value system and turquoise is a cool value system. And we just talked about those differences. So let's talk a little bit about turquoise now. Yeah. And um, for me, tur turquoise is... that. <laughs> There's, a, there's very few people, teams, organizations at this level. Um, so hence, there's not a lot of data points. Um, the big thing so far that they've laid out about this is when you start getting to the turquoise value system is they talk about this is a whole global view. Um, they can hold everything um, at the same time. Um, they're talking about they really do integral work at this level. Um, okay. And they can move between levels. Um, they can amplify them. They can dampen them. Um, and they are looking at almost like things from a unification point of view. Um, right. Needless to say, I'm probably not at this level. I'm even finding it hard to articulate it, to be honest. <laughs> um, there's still a lot that needs to be learned here. And what will unfold from this um, and so to notice why we talk about spiral dynamics uh, and why they chose the spiral as the metaphor is it's like a pendulum that swings as it's going through these value systems and if you think about us going through these you start with beige which is like 
individualistic. Mm. You're just there for survival. Then you're moving into purple, which is more clan, tribal based, which are a group. Then you, you swing back out. Now you're going to red, where there's somebody who's the leader. It's an individualistic thing. Then you swing back to blue, where now you've got a value system that everybody believes in. Then you go back to orange, where I'm a person who's driving for results. Then you go back to a green value um, system, where it's community-based. We're looking at everybody for, as a whole. And then we go from green back to yellow, where we as the individual are now at a second tier level. And then you go back to a group level at turquoise. So mm. that's kind of why I like keeping yellow and turquoise as a second tier one versus just the one teal level that they use in integral. Right. Gotcha. Okay. That, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about practical applications for this in the Azure world. So I'm thinking, let's talk about organizational change. Right. So as a consultant, you come in and you're looking at the organization and organizations, especially enterprises, you're going to see pockets of most likely different colors light up in this organization. Right. Yeah. Um, so you may see, you know, teams that are very blue. Right. A lot of blue teams. Right. But once in a while, you know, you may see an orange team. If you're in a startup, you might see a lot of orange teams yeah. and, and green teams. Right. Yeah. Depending on where you work. Um, there's an interesting thing about the culture, though, when it comes to leadership, right? So why don't you talk about that as far as the ability for, for teams to really only see things so much on their own without leadership being at, at, at a certain value system, right? Yeah. So, yeah, and the reason why we kind of got learned this uh, spiral dynamics is your leadership is going to set the tone of what's the highest value system that can exist in the organization. Mm. So if you've got an organization and if you've got a really green um, person at that leader at the green level, the organization itself won't be able to go higher than green. Mm. They might be orange and they might be a pocket of maybe yellow, but the organization as a whole won't be able to go higher. Right. Um, and what's probably happening at the moment is most folks in the business world are probably at orange levels. Um, so therefore the organizations as a whole come across as being orange. Right. Um, and as you say, you will have pockets within it that might be green and there might be other pockets that might be blue and you might even have a couple of people at red level, but in general, they won't be able to go higher than that person that's at the orange level. Right. That makes sense. So at a team level, um, some of the ways I use it is um, really thinking about observing a team, seeing what as a collective, what they tend to, um, what their value system really is, right? Is it more of a, um, is it more of a red, right? Where they just want to be told what to do, total authoritarian. I've seen teams like that, right? Yeah. So more of a blue where they really just like structure and order and process and and they're comfortable in that space, right? And that's what kind of makes them tick. Are they more of that orange where they're the results driven, right? Or are they a green team where they have awesome team dynamics, right? Um, they have great collaboration, communication, um, you know, is that kind of their, and, and diversity and those types of things. So I kind of look at that and I figure out as a coach, how can I help them make the best of what they are, right? Mm -hmm. where, where can I meet them at? What are the things that I can do with those teams to help them and um, not help them get from one thing to another per se, right? But just help them become better at what they are, right? Yeah. And then maybe introduce concepts if, I, if I'm working in the wall and I think they're, you know, they're performing at a high level at where they are. Maybe introduce some concept, uh, concepts from the next kind of level. So example I mentioned before is KPIs and metrics. When folks are just considered about process, let's introduce some of more of innovative way of thinking or metrics or empiricism into the process to try to help them along the ride. But ultimately it's up to them whether or not that, that resonates with them or not. It may not. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it's when you encounter a team that's at blue and you want to introduce these things that are at a green level, mm. what you'll probably find is a lot of people say, Oh, they're resistant to change. No, it's they kicking against that cause for them. It's like, wow, this is like two levels up. Right. It's kind of like, Let's introduce 
be one step ahead of them, not three or five steps ahead of them, because that's normally when you'll find people will reject you. Yeah. So it's a way to meet them where they at, make them the best at the level they're at, and then how can we make them curious or move them up a level in what they're doing in this agile space that we're working with them? And remember, what, I mean, just kind of piggybacking on what you're saying, William, is that we're not tr- necessarily trying to move people up, we, although if we think there are benefits from that a, a team could benefit from a certain next level way of working so if we think an orange team could benefit from more collaboration right from more th- uh, diversity of thought things like that then obviously we might introduce some of those concepts to them and stuff like that but ultimately it's about the ultimate goal is for the team to have the ability to kind of self-organize and, and pick and choose any of these things they want, kind of more of that yellow and turquoise way of thinking, right? Yeah. But you can't leapfrog, so we really just try to make people the best of what they are, right? And that's in myself too and William, and we all, we all have our own way of looking at the world, right? And we all have healthy and unhealthy manifestations of ourselves, right? Yeah. So that's really what we're talking about. Um, so and, and as a scrum master or a coach level, right, um, so if you're, so I coach a lot of scrum masters, right? So one of the things we're working on is if you're a scrum master on a team, understanding where your team's at, that's one thing, but also trying to understand where, where individuals on your team are at, because the team as its own entity could be one place, right? Have one value system, but you may have people on that team, which see the world differently, but as a collective, they have this one way of looking at it. So some people may be super open to green way of thinking. Personally, they may be this green value system, like right? But you may have other people on the team who are very need structure, process, very blue, right? So maybe the team itself won't really be able to be a green team if a lot of people there are blue, right? Even if you have individuals who are different value systems, right? So at, for one-on-one coaching, um, one thing you'll realize is that if you're working with teams and people seem to be resistant of change, right? Like you mentioned, William, a lot of that times it's not so much that they resist to change. It's just that you're introducing concepts to them that are, are contrary to the way they see the world, right? Yeah. And therefore, they're not going to go along with that. So in one-on-one coaching and trying to get the best out of that individual for them and for the team, it's more about where are they at and how can I help them become the best at what they are, right? Yeah. So they, meet, they may need a totally different style of coaching than other people on the team will. And so it's not a one-size-fits-all thing, and that's what I love about this Spiral Dynamics model. You know? Yeah, it's very fluid. Um, the thing as well that for this is literally trying to figure out how can you help them at where they at? Um, and sometimes it will be the collective is totally different than the individuals. Um, and it might be the conditions around them. I've been in places where it's a really orange organization. They just want to, you know, they're there for how much money are we going to make? How are we going to keep our uh, shareholders happy? Very orange value system from the organizational point of view. But the teams themselves are exhibiting all these green values. Um, mm. And at one point I was curious, so why is this happening? Then I noticed, oh, they've got a manager that holds the space for them where it happens. And that's kind of why you can have these pockets within an orange organization where these people are lighting up green. Um, and individually, they may not be there, but collectively they are. Mm. Um, the people on the team might be, who knows, some of them might be blue, some of them might even be there might be a yellow person in there for all we know right but for me i always try to concentrate on the collective um and how can i because that's how they're working together that's that's where the uh, center of gravity is for that team as such so one of the so i totally agree with you william on that but one of the things i found is let's say you're in a i don't know sprint planning meeting okay or something right and you're trying to get engagement out of team members that are seem to be disengaged, right? And a lot of the things that 
you may introduce like working agreements, a lot of green level, green value system type of stuff may not resonate with some folks on that team. So how do we get them, you know, more engaged in an individual level so the team can become stronger? And that's one of the things, that's basically what I was talking about when I was talking about the one-on-one coaching. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's where it's, the fact that you can apply this at any level, people, teams, programs, the whole company, leadership, you can really see it. Um, you can see it everywhere. Mm, Think about yeah, it. Yeah. And another another consideration is management or leadership. If you're, if I'm someone's manager, for instance, right, and I'm, um, let's say that I'm a super orange manager, right, and one of my reports is very green okay there's going to be a natural kind of almost a conflict there because you see the world very differently those two types of value systems right so the the ability to collaborate the ability to have good um working relationship with management even i I know that i know that companies probably won't or i can't say won't but most companies probably wouldn't decide who reports to who based on these value systems, okay? It's broad dynamics. But if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? That if you want to build resonance with people that are reporting to you, that you want to have people that are not in total contradiction to the way you see the world, right? And that's why for leadership, stuff like having this in reinventing organizations, they call it teal, but we're talking about yellow and turquoise kind of value system. That That is so powerful because you can re- at that point you can relate to anybody because you have seen the world the way they see it before and you can make the decisions any decision based on the best parts of any of the value systems right so that's like um, that's that, that's super awesome <laughs> for folks who, who are there you know um, and and I, I mean I've experienced leaders definitely who are at that um, yellow or, I don't know so much I don't know it's hard to pinpoint about the turquoise thing but I can definitely tell you yellow for sure. So let's tie this back to the Agile Manifesto as to wrap it up, okay? So the Agile Manifesto has four values and one sentence before the value, so we'll cover that last probably. Uh, so the first value is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So now that we went through this whole Spire Dynamics model, where do you think that value system lives? But that statement lives in what value system? Yeah, so for me, that one falls in the green value system um, because it's individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Right. Um, And green favors the group dynamics, humanistic nature of it, harmony. So that's why it's individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Right. Because if I have to ask the flip side and I have to say if we value processes and tools over individuals and interactions what color scheme would that be that most likely would be blue i'm thinking yeah yes okay (laughs) all right so how about the next one how about working software over comprehensive documentation uh to me that one falls in orange they results driven yep and they want to get and working software at the end of the day is how you're going to delight your customers Uh, so that's kind of, for me, why I'm putting it in that value system. So how about the reverse? Comprehensive documentation over working software. Where do you think that lives? Our friend, the blue value system is coming up for me again for some reason. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very nice. Okay. How about customer collaboration over contract negotiation? Um, that takes me back to the green value system. Because um, once again, people are at the center of that customer collaboration. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. So how about the inverse of that, which is contract negotiation over customer collaboration? Um, yeah. So for me, instead of going to blue, I think it's probably going to fall more in orange because um, contracts is big in the business world. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it's kind of like, yep, we, we've got that in writing. So let's deliver that. It drives you towards results. Gotcha. So that's kind of why I'm seeing it there on that value system. All right. So how about um, last one, responding to change or we're following a plan? Um, I'm probably going to, I'll put that in, in the yellow one because it's the flex flow. How do we change? How do we keep adapting? How do we okay. respond to what's happening in the environment? Right. So the ability to respond and adapt 
for any situation, right? And yeah. not getting bogged down at one, one right way of seeing the world, right? Yeah. So that's where that yellow comes in, right? So the inverse of that, okay, which would be following a plan over responding to change. Yeah, that probably will go back to like the blue value meme. It's mm. kind of like, yep, we, we predict and plan. We lay out, you know, yeah. we, we plan to work and we work the plan. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the last one is, uh, is the statement is um, uh, we are uncovering uh, better ways of developing software and paraphrasing it, right? Um, by um, doing it and helping others do it. Okay. So there's a couple set statements in that sentence, right? So uncovering better ways by doing it and helping others do it. So where do you think that lies? Hmm. So I can probably, we can look at it from three perspectives almost. Sure. If you look at it for, we want to drive for results. We want to look for better things to get better results. Mm -hmm. Then I would see it in the orange value system. Right. If we uncover better ways to work to together and to collaborate that falls in the green value system if that's the piece you want to highlight there right if you want to find multiple ways of doing it i would say that falls in the yellow value system because there you're looking at this is the outcome i want where are different ways or different roads that i can take to get there yeah yeah that that sentence rings yellow to me as well yeah because it's kind of the essence it's the good essence of the green and the orange at the same time, you know, which yeah. is which is awesome. All right, William. So where can people find out more about this? Because we've gone on a while, but we've really just kind of the tip of the iceberg on this stuff. If you want to get into it, it's it's way more than just an hour long podcast or however long this is. So, yeah. Uh, so there's a couple of books out. Um, one is called Spiral Dynamics, written by Don Beck and Christopher Cohen. There is Spiral Dynamics Integral, uh, written by Don Beck. I don't know if he had a co-author there. I don't think so. Um, yeah. And then there is, because uh, Spiral Dynamics is kind of into its third phase of existence. It keeps evolving. And the current or latest incarnation is called Spiral Dynamics Integral. And they actually have a website, and I will let you put the website up with the podcast. Yeah, um, it's a great website because it... Everything we explain on this, it goes into much more detail and it kind of shows you the value systems and, and coping mechanisms for folks or people in those value systems and how to help, you know, get the best out of those people. It kind of gives you a lot of good tips on there, it has a lot of great articles and resources and, and um, white papers and research on there that you can check out. Um, so again, Spiral Dynamics, the book, Spiral Dynamics Integral, the book. I've read that one, Sprawl Dynamics Integral. Um, we're not going to get into integral theory right now, but uh, it has to do with that, right? So, um, so Don Beck, um, if you actually, if you get the audio book to Sprawl Dynamics Integral, Don Beck uh, narrates it himself. Uh -huh. nice. So um, that's, a, that's a pretty cool thing. Um, yes. So it's a good uh, six or seven or eight hours. And I can't remember how long it is, but um, driving around, it's not, a, it's not a bad thing to listen to. So. I'm glad we're enjoying it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, thank you, William. I want to thank you for your time. So where can people find you uh, out on the internet? Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter? Yeah. So on LinkedIn, just look for William Stridom. I should be the only one out there. But if not, I'm the one that's over in, I think, America, it says. Um, on Twitter, my handle is just at WL Stridom. Okay. And, uh, and I'm at G4S Troy on Twitter. Okay. And on the Agile Uprising. All right. Cool. Thank you for having me, Troy. Enjoyed All right. It. Thank you.